Howdy, this is Mackenzie Franklin from Side Game LLC here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Today we're going to be continuing the What We've Been Playing series. These are 10 mini reviews about board games that I've been enjoying, and I want to share maybe some thoughts or just some special things about these games. If you have any questions about anything you see here, please let me know down in the comments below. I'll also make sure to list and go through every single game that I've played in these last couple of weeks. With all that being said, if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please make sure that you do. It is the best way to help us grow, let's talk about some games. The first game I want to talk about is QE, a simple set collection auctioning game where you're having a hidden auction. The player is going to set the price of the tile that they're selling, and then every other player will secretly write down their value on a little checkbook and then put it in the center of the table. You'll look to see who has spent the most, and then you'll write down that value on the back of the tile and then give it to the player. Then you'll keep on doing this until all the tiles have run out. But the hook of this game is you can bid whatever you want. There's no limit. You can write down whatever you want on that tile, either as the person setting the price or as the person who's bidding. And this is the pull of the game, the interesting thing that makes you want to play it again and again. Now, unfortunately, this game for me has paled after a couple of plays. I seem to be doing the same things every time and seem to be experiencing the same effects. What usually ends up happening is bids start low. Then they progressively get bigger and there's a big turn where the value jumps significantly. Whoever has accumulated the most tiles in those first couple of turns usually ends up winning the game. They just haven't spent a lot of money, so they have some more flexibility in that money. The other thing that happens in this game is it drags, unfortunately. I played this with a group of students of mine, and one of the kids started with this, where they would do exponents, starting using scientific notation, and the numbers got enormous. It was not a fun experience because you are waiting for everybody to write down their values on these checkbooks and it just isn't fun. It gets to a point where everybody is just done with the game. The values get so absurdly high and if you're not bidding high, you're probably going to lose. So it becomes a race of, okay, how big can I make these numbers? And it really bogs down the experience. So I, unfortunately, the unrestricted environment that is QE is its downfall, unfortunately, and it leads to a lot of either repetitive game experience experiences with that switch in the center, or it's going to lead to scenarios like this where the numbers just get so astronomical that it really does not become a fun game. I do recommend the game High Society if you're looking for something that offers a similar experience, but is a way better game in my opinion. It has more interesting auctions with using different values of cards and having to play and add to them and not being able to break up sets. It has positive and negative cards in the auctions, which I think is so interesting because that's where some of the swings can come in, and it also has an unpredictability in the order in which things play out, but also still managing your money with that set amount. It's a bit more restrictive because you really can't bid anything, but it gives you a lot of very awesome choices in a tight package. Amazing game, High Society. QE, unfortunately, probably leaving our library. The next game is It's a Wonderful Kingdom, a two-player version of It's a Wonderful World. This features an I cut, you choose mechanism where at the start of each round, they'll be playing cards into different piles, and then the other player will take one of those piles. You have some tokens that you can use to put these cards face down, because there are potentially negatives in these piles, but you also have the opportunity to maybe hide a card that you just don't want your opponent to see, because it has some inherent value that you'll kind of understand the more that you play. There's a lot of cool things here, but the big feature of this game is the fact that it uses a module system. Every time you play, you must play with one of the modules. This could be creatures that you're fighting, it could be different traders that you're using to get additional bonuses, or it could be something like a quest that you're going to be sending your soldiers on to complete for additional bonuses throughout the game and some big endgame condition. But my favorite module, the one that I want to talk about in this case, is actually a Kickstarter exclusive module. And I'm really sorry for those who have gotten the base game version of this, but I think that this module is just clearly above and beyond. And this is called the Conquest module. The Conquest module gives you these troops that you'll be sending to the secondary map board, and the troops will provide you with a variety of bonuses, including production bonuses, the abilities to get trap tokens, and these peaking tokens, and ways to control and, at the end of the game, get extra scoring. I really like this system because the boards are different and are going to have different bonuses, which will vary the gameplay. In addition, whenever you gain soldier tokens in the game, you're going to spend those soldiers to deploy new troops or move your existing troops on the board. You're going to be trying to pivot and move into your opponent's territory to reduce the amount of points and production they're getting, and it really does benefit and allows you to use your soldiers in different ways. I really like this system and I think that it's the best module because it adds this extra layer of decision making when it comes to spending your soldiers wisely. I love all the different bonuses that you can get and the variability between the boards. This is a great time. Love the conquest module in It's a Wonderful Kingdom. Up next we have Maracaibo where you play as the captain to a crew in the Caribbean. 
They'll be up to all sorts of shenanigans going through a campaign and seeing the story and the area of the Caribbean develop throughout your journeys. Now, this new expansion, the Uprising, features a whole bunch of new cards, which I absolutely adore. They have a lot of variable costs and very interesting effects that are going to vary that experience from turn one. I love that in this game, you can pick a card that you want to play, put it in that reserve section on that first turn, and make that a strategy that you gravitate towards. I really enjoy this experience as a whole, and there's so much to love with the new expansion. But one thing I really want to talk about is the new boards and the new abilities that go on the boards. The boards are now recessed, which is wonderful quality of life improvement, but they're also modular tiles that you can affix into the board. They're double sided, so you can really customize the game to how you see fit. The first one here has you with the options to remove cubes on the board, which is a really neat way of using combat to repel the invading colonists. I think that's really interesting, but you can also keep it on that standard version that you'll see in the base game. You also have a new replacement to one of the actions in the original game, where you're going to get two coins at a compass instead or you can flip them in order to get personal player abilities. They have a one-time effect where you can score 10 points or so, and then they'll also have some passive effect that's going to give you additional bonuses. I love this system as it's going to guide your strategy from turn one, or you can totally ignore it and just use that compass side for more varied gameplay, and I think compasses are pretty great and underrated. The last action here allows you to swap out the $5 instant bonus with a $4 instant bonus and then a new village action you can take. You can spend combat power during a village action to remove cubes from areas that you visited and you get additional bonuses for doing so. I really like this system and I think it just makes a lot of sense. And when you're able to collect enough of these tokens, you're gonna to get an additional bonus for the number of combats you've taken. There's a lot of great variety here and all of these different abilities here on these compass reverse sides are different and they make for extremely varied gameplay experiences in tandem with the cards that have been added with the new Uprising expansion. If you love Maracaibo or you're interested in the game, I recommend this one extremely. I think it's so fantastic. Huge quality of life improvements, just more variability for a game that already had it. And the second campaign, we're already five chapters in, and it is so much fun. A lot of great ideas here. Really fascinating cards. That's Maracaibo, the Uprising. Up next, we have Phantom Inc., an extremely esoteric party game that works so extremely well. And I really love this system. It's best at four, where you have two teams of two. One person will be a ghost communicating a message, and the other person will be trying to figure out that message. Now, the phantom here is going to be given a card by the other player, and the card will have a suggestion or a question. For example, what is a group of them called? What country am I most likely to find it? Where do I find it in the grocery store? And they have a secret word that they're going to be answering these questions towards. Now, it's up to the ghost to pick out of two of these cards that are given to them by the other player and decide which one's going to be most helpful in actually figuring out the clue. Now, only only that team knows what card has been passed, but the one that does not get taken is revealed to the other players. So maybe that's going to be some helpful information. Now, based on that question, the ghost player draws a single letter. And it's up to the communicator to be like, okay, do I think that I know what they're trying to say based on that single letter, or do I let them keep on going? When they decide that they've seen enough of these letters, they say, silencio, and then that person stops. And now it's up to the person who's interpreting to write down letters to try to guess the word. And they write down letters letters one at a time. This is so weird in how it works, and I don't know if I'm doing an incredible job of explaining it, but if you play this game, there's a point where it clicks. You think, you see the letters, you see the words, and you try to create these connections based on what questions you're asking, and then it reverses where the other team that is also trying to guess the same word is going to be doing the exact same thing. You're watching them carefully, trying to anticipate what sort of questions have been asked and how it connects to yours. You'll be thinking in your head, writing down little notes to yourself, mental notes, and figuring out what this word is until it eventually clicks for you, and this is just such a gratifying moment. This is one of those party games that comes around every once in a while that I just think is so interesting and so unique in what it does, but it does it exceptionally well. So that is Ghost Rider, amazing four-player board game. Next is Marvel Legendary, a deck building game by Ultra Pro, where you're gonna be using your stars to recruit different Marvel heroes into your arsenal, and then using those heroes to take down the villains that populate the city, and hopefully eventually the mastermind who's trying to fulfill some evil scheme. The newest expansion for Marvel Legendary, the Messiah Complex, just released, and my wife Ariana and I have played a lot of it and explored all the content that's available. She really enjoys the game, so this is one that we do play a lot of, and when a new expansion comes out, that's kind of our evening. The main keyword that I wanna talk about in 
the new expansion is the clone keyword. So the way it works is when you play a card with clone, you get to take a copy of that card, an exact copy from the HQ or the hero deck and put it into your discard pile. So you're replicating the effects and you're going to see that card more often. Now this pairs really well with certain characters, in particular this me, myself, and I card, because there's a new keyword that was also introduced called tactical formation. If you have cards that have those exact costs in your hand, you get an additional effect. And if you're cloning them and getting more copies, you're going to usually get those additional effects off pretty quickly. In addition, some of these new characters have cheaper ultimate cards, which is great because usually they'll be allowed to be cloned themselves, and they get your engine going pretty quickly. It reminds me a lot of the size changing mechanism in the Ant-Man expansion, where you're getting a lot of usually not extremely powerful cards, but you're getting them quickly, which is going to increase the potency of your deck pretty quickly and allow you to actually be proactive on the board, which I think is really, really nice. Now, each of these characters does have some form of payoff. In the example of Multiple Man here, he has Perfect Match, which gives you extra strength strikes based on the number of cards you've played that have the same name. And with cloning, this is usually going to happen pretty often, so it does scale in its strength. I really like the way that this system works, and I love how they really feed into each other with this cloning mechanism. And this cloning keyword is actually on the villains too. Whenever a card with cloning enters from the villain deck into play, it's going to actually summon a second copy of itself. And I just think that's a lot of fun. It makes it a bit scary when more of these creatures come out, but generally they're a little weaker to balance things out, which means that you can usually take down some of them or maybe half of their strength. There's some great decisions here, great deck building choices when it comes to cloning, and I really love how tactical formation also makes that a bit stronger. So that is the Messiah Complex expansion for Marvel Legendary. Up next we have Vagrant Song, a boss battling game where you play as vagrants jumping onto a train that seems to be going through some spiritual limbo as you are taking down haint after haint by restoring their humanity and helping them pass on. There's a lot to love about Vagrant Song and I actually talked a lot about it on Corporate Cardboard on our recent episode but I want to talk specifically about the scenario setup and just how well done the scenarios are in the game. At the start of each scenario, you're going to be putting out these tokens, tiles, and populating the same train board you're using. But the way that you do it is by putting event tokens on specific spots. You have event tokens that are on the board, which represent points of interest that you can go investigate, which is super enticing and going to want to make you go explore those things. But you also have events that are going to populate the rounds as well as the health of the haint that you're fighting. Now, this is really interesting because it's kind of a timer that you know something's going to happen. So maybe you prioritize something for certain scenarios, or you know that some thing will happen during those thresholds when you're taking down the health of the Haints. This is so interesting and so fascinating because you'll never really know what to expect, but you know that it's going to be thematic based on the character you're fighting. So interesting and I love this. I love just how universal all of these event tokens are from each game, but how varied and different they're going to be based on the scenario you're actually facing. I love how there could be positives and negatives and based on when and where they happen, it's going to be thematic, helpful or hurtful, and you're going to have to pivot to strategize around them. I love I love this experience, I love the system of events, and I love how the actions are taken in general. I could talk about this game all day. I think this game is absolutely wonderful. It's such a joy to play, such a joy to set up, and so clean in how it works and how all of the tokens are used pretty much all the time so well. I think Vagrant Song is wonderful, and if this is a theme that you're interested in or style of game you're interested in playing, you need to give this one a try. So that is Vagrant Song. Up next is the game Now or Never, where you play as a hero in the land of Arzium. You'll be interacting with the board, going on quests, fighting monsters, as well as trying to rescue villagers and bring them home to your ancestral village, hoping to build it up by constructing buildings and doing your best to populate those buildings with those villagers you're finding. One of my favorite things about Now or Never has to be the quest system as a whole. At the start of the game, you're going to get a bunch of quest cards and some characters can draw them throughout the game but they're going to give you specific bonus objectives that you can take by visiting different locations on the map. So based on the quest cards you pick it's going to give you some cool strategy and some path that you're going to want to travel this map to find. I really like this system and I like that some of the different cards have varied costs, some give you extra scoring conditions and some are going to give you passive abilities that you'll have throughout the game. Others are just tiny little objectives here and there but it's up to you what objectives you take and keep and what your focus is going to be. I really like this system and it keeps me excited to travel and navigate my way through Arzium. In addition, I really like the building system that you can see here, where you're going to be trying to puzzle out what types of buildings to build for different passive bonuses, different incomes, as well as effects to gather more villagers and store them throughout the game. I really love that you can explore Arzium from turn one and use those cards in your hand and start chaining them together in order to have one long experience. 
Very satisfying game. This is now or never. Next, we have the game Detective Club, an amalgamation of other party games, things like Fake Artist Goes to New York, as well as using these large illustrated cards from games like Dixit or Mysterium, but does things in such a well-done way, and I think it needs to be talked about. In order to appreciate this game, you need to know how it plays and just how smooth the process is. Whoever's turn it is is going to write a keyword on these notepads and pass one to each player. However, one of those notepads does not have the word on it. It's up to now the clue giver to play a card that will help facilitate and help the person who doesn't know what the word is figure out what the clue is. For example, if it's food, you might play this spaghetti monster out here to say, hey, it's food, spaghetti, follow me out. The next person in line in clockwise order is going to play a card from their hand that will help tell other players that they know what the clue is. And everybody will go around the table and do this until it get back to the main player. That player will play a second card and will do it again. Now, starting with the player on the left of the person who played the first card and gave the clues, they're going to have to explain why they chose these cards. But before that's done, the person who gave out the clues tells what the clue is. After everyone has given their explanation, everybody is going to take their magnifying glass and place it on the person who they thought didn't know the keyword. If the person who didn't know the keyword was able to evade the eyes of everybody else and blend in, then excellent, they score extra points, and so does the person giving the clue. Remember, it's up to that person to help the other person. They're not trying to be cryptic, and I think this is absolutely wonderful. Now that you know how to play the game, let's talk about the two things that I think really elevate this as a game experience. The first thing is the player-driven nature of the entire experience. The players have to decide what the keyword is. The players have to make sure that they're playing cards that are appropriate for the keyword, and then it's up to the players to explain their reasoning and rationale for picking these cards, or maybe for the reason they didn't pick certain cards. And I love this about it. It's player first, and that is so wonderful. The vehicle is a way to help engage the players for interacting with one another. And another strong element is the supportive nature of the game. When the person giving out the keywords is telling their clue, they're doing so in a way to be helpful to the player that's out of it. And that is such a wonderful, refreshing take. You're not trying to mess over anybody, you're trying to be as supportive and helpful as possible. So you are cleverly crafting this clue in order to support someone at the table that you're creating this bond with and you're not even sure what that is yet. And I think this is so wonderful. It's up to those players to then support one another, give feedback throughout the conversation and discussion, and I think that this is so awesome. Detective Club is a positive player-driven experience that I think you need to give a try if you enjoy this style of game or you're interested in finding one of these party games that may work for you. Next, we have Nemesis Lockdown. This is the sequel to Nemesis, where you're playing Alien, the board game. Now the Nemesis has actually landed onto the Martian base, and the staff there, as well as some of the survivors from that previous experience is going to have to deal with these new Night Stalker terrorists that are storming the base. Nemesis Lockdown has a lot of new features, but one I want to talk about in particular is the board. Now the board is actually double-sided, one just being the standard base on Mars, and the other one actually having a way that you can travel to the surface. It adds a bit more complexity and some more interesting choices you have to make, but also some new scary events, and I think it's a great addition. Now that being said, the main boards themselves though are actually separated into three distinct sections. So you have three different different floors of the base that you're going to be traveling towards, and this is pretty terrifying because it takes quite a bit longer to travel around than it would in the normal game, and I really appreciate this as it changes that experience dramatically. There's also an elevator that you can use to travel between the floors, so they may become pretty populated areas and something that you tend to use pretty frequently. But the huge binding factor between all of these floors is the fact that the floors are now powered. There's a new power resource that exists in the game, a generator room that will allow you to add power to specific rooms, and they do a lot of great things for the areas. First off, if you power the elevator, you can use that to zip around. But the other cool thing about the power is when you attack, the lights are on. You have better advantages of shooting. You can see, go figure. But this works inversely too, because if you're fighting in the dark, the night stalkers, the aliens have a better chance of attacking you, and some more negative effects can happen when they attack. Whoa, there's a lot of cool things to love in this system with the darkness mechanisms, the new board, the surface mechanic, and all of the new rooms are just that much more difficult to explore. So employing and using specific peaking abilities and tiles are really necessary. To balance out all this new difficulty and new changes, the characters in, that you'll be using are a lot stronger, and I really appreciate that because I feel like my character is a lot more unique as I play them through this experience. There's a lot to love in Nemesis Lockdown. I definitely would recommend that you try the initial game first, and this is, adds a lot more complexity and small, more rules that existed in the first game, and I think that is something to be aware of. This is definitely a step more when it comes to thematic natures, but that means it's a bit more heavy because a lot of the rules are really 
edge case scenarios. So a lot to think about, but a lot to enjoy. And if you like Nemesis, no brainer, get locked down. Wonderful experience. The last game we're talking about is In Too Deep. This is a game with a really interesting theme as you play as members of the police force who are jacking in, joining and controlling the minds of criminals. You're going to be using the criminals that you've jacked into to satisfy specific criteria of these goal cards in your hand. For example, you may need to have one of the criminals you're controlling holding a specific item with another specific criminal with a specific item. The more convoluted the description is, the higher the amount of reward you'll be getting for completing that condition. So there's a lot of interesting things going on here with trying to position things, moving things around, and looking at that game state on your turn and figuring out what you need to do to satisfy your conditions the best way possible. There's a lot of things that I like about Into Deep. In particular, I think the theme is really cool, and I love the grip system. I love that you'll take control of a character, you'll get to use that character, Character. And the more you do, the higher your grip gets, which gets you the ability to use their abilities because you've got to know them, right? And you can even take extra actions by moving it down. But the grip system incentivizes you to use a lot of different characters because you're going to get extra points at the end of the game for the lowest grip on one of your characters. So I really like this grip system and how you're going to be improving it over time. But the big deteriorator for this game is the way that the game flows and the amount of tactical decisions you're taking as opposed to strategy and how that's all front loaded to the start of your turn. During this game, you're trying to satisfy the conditions of these cards. Once again, have a character in a specific spot with an item, etc. But a single movement on an opponent's turn is going to change the game state dramatically. And if you're playing with more than two, then it's going to be changing pretty dang consistently every turn. But even at that two player count, which is what I learned how to play this game at, it would happen where I would have something set up on my turn that I was trying to do my objectives, and then my opponent would move a single piece, one space, and all of a sudden, all my work in that previous turn was done and just because of a single movement or a single activation of ability. And that was a little frustrating. But the biggest thing here is the overall pacing of the game. If you're playing this one, you really have to think at the start of your turn because you have a new puzzle every turn that you're going to have to be going towards. And that can really bog down the gameplay when you're like, oh, I've got to reassess the entire situation because a single piece of information is moved. And I think this would just be exacerbated in the larger player games, which is pretty unfortunate. So not one that I think we'll be adding to our library because of that issue, but I love this theme in and I think that this could be re-implemented into a different system. So that is In Too Deep. Some great ideas, an amazing theme, but unfortunately the pacing is going to be preventing it from entering our library. So those are all the games that I wanted to talk about in the last two weeks. I'm going to quickly go over the 41 unique titles that we played in the last two weeks, and if you want to know any more about those, please let me know down in the comments below. Let's get going! QE, Ethnos, It's a Wonderful Kingdom, Arkham Horror the Card Game, Mysterium Park, Maracaibo, Burgle Bros 2, Phantom Inc., Terraforming Mars, Ares Expedition, Hadrian's Wall, Marvel Legendary, Vagrant Song, King Domino Origins, Azul Summer Pavilion, Bullet Heart, Age of Empires 3, Age of Discovery, Cloud Spire, Canvas, Acquire, Jab, Arkham Noir, Targi, Mind Management, Now or Never, Detective Club, Camel Up, Nemesis Lockdown, Bullet Heart, Dune Imperium, Parade, Marvel Champions, Hollertau, Whistle Mountain, Cascadia, Capital X2 Generations, Glenmore 2 Chronicles, Super Fantasy Brawl, Underwater Cities, Mercurial, Boon Lake, and In Too Deep. Once again, if you have any questions about any of the games discussed here or that I listed in that previous list, please let me know down in the comments below. What games have you been playing these last couple of weeks? Are there any games on here that you're excited to try that you have any interesting opinions or thoughts on? I'd love to hear what you think. But thank you so much for watching. Side Game Strong.